So I'd ask people to try and avoid a, um, uh, getting into a spiral of fear here. The government will demand answers from the insurance industry if policy costs do not fall over the coming months. Data published today shows personal injury claims payouts have fallen by an average of 50% since new guidelines were introduced in April. However, the government is advising policyholders not to expect a 50% decrease in premiums. There's been a further 397 COVID-19 cases. 54 people are in hospital with the virus, an increase of three in 24 hours. 16 are in ICU, which is up two over the same period. Chief Medical Officer Dr Tony Houlihan says there are small but concerning increases which will be monitored closely. But Professor Cleonette Newcalli, consultant in infectious diseases at St James's Hospital, says the healthcare system will be able to cope for now. People who are, are doubly vaccinated are really protected against severe illness. And the groups that are remaining that are unvaccinated are groups in which the percentage of people who get really sick and need to come into hospital is very low. So I think we're probably going to be OK for the moment. And finally, Gardaí are to amend their policing strategy in Dublin following complaints over their handling of large crowds in the city centre. Councillors raised concerns at a meeting of the Joint Policing Committee this afternoon. In response, Assistant Commissioner Anne-Marie Cagney says Gardaí are changing their strategy to incorporate the needs of the city. We then decided to turn that into a high visibility presence of frontline responders on the ground. And that's currently what's going on. So, Councillor McAdam, if you're not meeting the guard on the ground, I'm very disappointed to hear that because I'm meeting them at weekends and I actually go out and about at weekends to make sure that it's working correctly. It's two minutes past eight. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. School's out. Time for a family holiday in Spain, Italy, Portugal and Greece. Tonight it'll be cloudy and misty with patchy rain and drizzle, heaviest in the south and west. Lowest temperatures of 9 to 12 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Football on Off the Ball. With Paddy Powers, save our game. England's goals total 80k so far for Irish football. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie now you're welcome back. So on this, the eve of England-Denmark at Euro 2020, who better to talk to than a man who's been the England manager who was assistant to Sven Goran Eriksson at three major tournaments and who signed Gareth Southgate, the player, made him as captain at Middlesbrough. I am, of course, talking about Steve McLaren, who is with us, who's also technical director at Derby these days. Steve, how are you doing? I'm very good, John. How are you? Great. Good to have you with us. Can I start in an odd place for a second? Have you seen the new Alex Ferguson documentary on Amazon? I haven't. I'm waiting for one of them quiet moments where I've got the house to myself. I can uh, sit down, lay down, relax and enjoy it because I've heard it's uh, one hell of a treat, very emotional and a true reflection of the man himself. They do a really interesting thing for the final in Barcelona in 99 without any talking or commentary. They just have the camera fixed on the sideline and it's fantastic theatre. And the moment when Sheridan scores the first goal, you all go ballistic, obviously, and then you run over to Ferguson. And it looks like, I, I would presume, I don't know how well you remember these moments, but I presume you're thinking extra time, what changes do we need to make? Absolutely. Um, being pragmatic and, and, and unbelievable to be in that situation back in the game, I thought, oh, right, let's get ready. It's not enough time. To, to kick off and to score again and it will be extra time but um, no, the gaffer said no, sit down Steve this game's not over and uh, <laughs> as usual he was right What set him apart Steve as a matter of interest we will get on to England don't worry but it's not every day you get to talk to someone who saw Ferguson work first hand the way you did No, I think one um, he was a winner one hell of a competitor and um, he was a consistent winner, winner. so Winning after winning is very difficult, but he mastered the art of that. Uh, he'd win, uh, like the treble. We won that. I wanted a holiday. I was exhausted. Uh, I spent it three weeks away. And um, after the celebrations, uh, ticket take, the, the, the bus journey around the city, he said, see you tomorrow, nine o'clock at the cliff. Bacon buddies, cup of tea, put your medals away. What are we going to do next season? Oh. And that that sets him apart from anybody else because people win. Oh, no, okay, the manager may be on it, but the players are not. He made sure he was on it. He made sure the staff was on it. 
and the players when they came back. Mm. A serial winner who had tremendous trust, and trust is a big thing um, with his staff, with his players. He trusted them to do the job. Uh, they knew what they had to do. And um, I think the key thing was he was so adaptable to to be successful for a few years. It's a decade is a miracle. 27 years, so many trophies. Is um, is testament to his adaptability in terms of creating one team, dismantling it, creating another team, dismantling it. So knowing the kind of characters, the kind of players that were his players, Manchester United players and winners. Mm. And them three ingredients were integral to, uh, to his success. Was he very involved in your coaching? You had a great reputation as a young coach. Did he want to know what you were doing, why you were doing it? No, he, he, from the first day, um, trust, I said, was a big thing. And first day I went into his office, we'd just beat Notts Forest 8-1. And I wondered what the hell to coach on a Monday morning. <laughs> And I asked him, what do, what do I coach? And he just said, what did you coach at Derby? And before I got the answer out, he said, that's why you're here. Go yeah. out there and coach. He never told me a thing. So I had a clean sheet of paper. And um, he trusted me to do the job. And that was key. There was a lot of pressure, don't get me wrong. But it was um, it was the key knowing that, um, you know, he could, he could come out to training, he could walk around, he could have his influence over individual players. But... He let me do all the coaching and that takes courage and guts, but he's had many years of that. And um, he came alive on match days. They were his, they were his days, right. match days, the game, winning. And, uh, and my job was just making sure we got the players ready Monday to Friday for Saturday. Were the players the demanding bunch when it came to your sessions? Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think. You know, uh, the gaffer was demanding, demanding of them, demanding of his staff. If you couldn't do the job, you were gone, without a doubt. Nice. And uh, the, but the players were so tested; it was, it was, it was war every day. Um, you know, I like to keep training intense and competitive, uh, and and keep it on a line. Yeah. Go over the line. We have chaos. Go under the line. We have. It's too quiet. It's sterile. Yeah, just try to keep it on that line, and many, many times we went over. Um, but it showed me that the top, top level, top, top players, top, top management, environment, culture, what it was all about. It was the kind of finishing school for me at, at coaching. Mm. So if Roy Keane didn't think your session was up to much, he might oh, let you know. Yeah. I suspect most definitely, yeah. without a shadow of a doubt. And, uh, and he did many times. We had a few eruptions <laughs> as we did with other players. Uh, one last thing on Ferguson to ask you about. It seemed looking in from afar, he had this unbelievable knack of picking the right team for certain games. Like there were times where you'd see a Ferguson team sheet and think, Gee, I didn't quite see that coming. And then invariably things would work out just fine. I think he had a, a squad of players that they could all do the job. And he trusted them to do the job. Mm. And if they couldn't do the job, they were out very quickly. So he had 25, 26 players who he knew he could rotate. He could pull in and out, play them in some games, get them ready for other games. And that was that was his master stroke. Yeah. Managing the season. And and you're absolutely right. I always had a, once had a conversation with Jordi Cruyff. I said, God, yeah, you've worked with him, you know, a couple of years. What, what is it about him? He said, he gets every decision right. He <laughs> makes changes. It works. Yeah. He makes changes in the game, formation, personnel. You don't know what he's doing. You don't. He's, you think he hasn't got a clue, <laughs> and you win the game. Yeah. He scores a goal. You know, Andy Cole's a perfect example. Half time, we're losing one on against Tottenham. It brings him on at half time. Two minutes later, Andy Cole scores the goal. He scores the winner. So he has that unbelievable knack. I call it experience, mm. just knowledge, uh, just keeping the players on the toes, ready when they uh, when they're asked to play. He he was unbelievable at that. Yeah, a one off. 
So, England at a major tournament. You've been to Japan and Korea. You were at the Euros in 04, 06 under Sven. What did you learn from tournament football, Steve? And, and, and what are you seeing at the moment from England? Uh, one, you have to get out the group. Once you get into the knockout stages, it can be a lottery. Anybody can win it. Mm. And the defining moments have to go your way. So you've got to make sure, like uh, like Muller in Germany who went through one-on-one, -on -one, he has to miss to go your way. Mm. Um, and things have to go for you. Look, referees' decisions, whatever it may be. You always have a penalty shootout, invariably, and you have to win that. And you have to make sure that you keep 11 players on the field because even though you can be the best team with 10 players, you never win, not at this level. Mm. Uh, we've had that a couple of times. Lost players never won, knocked out the tournaments. So you may be the best team, but not necessarily the best team wins the tournament in the end. Mm. You have to be pragmatic. England have been that. You have to take your opportunities, your chances, and make sure that, um, look, be that 3 5%, which I know they've they put a figure to it, Mm. That three or five percent has to go your way. Of that um, golden generation around that time, I'd be, it's something I really wanted to get your thoughts on. Gary Neville's talked about it. Other players have talked about it. Uh, I mean, one to eleven, it was a phenomenal lineup, a phenomenal collection of players. And there were times where Neville and others would say they would come off the pitch against lesser opposition, and they would have been, you know, come off worse in possession, for instance, and kind of scratching our heads as to how that's happened. What's your perspective on that? I'd be fascinated to hear. Um, I, I believed in, in, in them days, their golden generation, I believe we had a good 11, 12, 13 players, one that could, uh, could, could win a tournament. But from my experience, every tournament we went to, uh, we were always exhausted at the end of the Premier League season, right. always tired. Seven, eight games in a tournament, you need energy and you need to rotate. I don't think we have the depth of squad that the current squad has. Right. Therefore, we were vulnerable in games. And I think that was a key one. We got injuries. And once we got injuries to big players, like we had once with Beckham, once with Rooney, and especially the Rooney one, mm. uh, once you lose your best player, then it dimin diminishes you a lot. We did not have, like England have now, 25, 26 players of a level who can compete technically, tactically, physically, and mentally with the other opponents. We have now developed our players over the last 10 years through uh, the Premier and the FA initiatives, through EPPP, uh, through Dan Ashworth, Jed Roddy, who set the principles in place, and Gareth, Gareth was at the start of this as well, as head of development in terms of the players working at grassroots schools. He bought into it and he's seen how the academies of the clubs in England have developed, have a pro performance program and are producing players technically as good as any in the world. Mm tactically now can adapt because they're doing that in the Premier League, they're doing that in Europe every day, and they can adapt to different tactics. Physically, they play with such power, intensity, and the key thing is speed. We have got so much speed in our squad and mm. power in our squad. Physically, we are above the rest in Europe. And mentally, we're building that belief and confidence that we are a good team. Once we win a trophy, and I hope it's this trophy, the Euros, I believe we can dominate for many years, a little bit like uh, Spain did, a little bit like Germany did. And they did the same as what we've done for the last 10 years. Germany did the same, failed in a tournament, reevaluated, got to work, coached the coaches, uh, develop the talent, get them playing competitive football, best versus the best, and they produce a, a winning World Cup team and Euro team. 
Same with Spain, they did the same. It took failure on England's part to look at themselves, look inward, get the resources to develop coaches, develop the talent, um, get them into to competitions, audit the academies, make sure that they're at a standard, and look what we're producing. Mm. We're producing player after player, young player after young player, and players now, in, in, in my day with England, were never sought after in Europe. There was no respect from Europe of our players. Now, there is huge respect from Europe of all our players. Mm. You're one of the few people who knows the reality of being in that job and it, there is so much scrutiny and so much pressure. It seems like Gareth Southgate's handled it uh, very well in so many ways. I mean, your first press conference, first question, in fact, first press conference, because Scolari had been in for the job and then withdrew his candidacy. And so you sit down and at this stage, Middlesbrough have been to UEFA Cup final. You've won a cup, international experience over the years, European football. And how does it feel, Steve, to be second choice? Boom, up and running. <laughs> Welcome to the big time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then many, many, you know, in that era, we were talking about the, the media attention and, and how there was a big divide. And, you know, there was so much criticism of the players and the players were always looking at the marks in the paper. I oh, didn't like the criticism. Yeah. And there was a fear playing for England. And I think that's been spoken about. And it was definitely there definitely there mm. and i just i just look and one thing i i, I a snapshot of of the the past and the present showed the players uh, cooling down in a swimming pool messing about in the water with unicorns and uh, and inflatables and playing like five six year olds enjoying life enjoying each other enjoying the company Mm. Could you imagine <laughs> 20 years ago, uh, the England players and mm. that photograph being in the media? It would have been uh, it would have been ridiculed at that ridiculed. time. So that's quite yeah. an interesting uh, analogy. Well, it's, it's, isn't it fascinating to see the way media has changed? And who knows why that is? Maybe media are more aware of players' mental health. Maybe it's just the media aren't as powerful. Like you know, uh, right through from the treatment Bobby Robson was on the receiving end through to Graham Taylor and the turn up, the vilification of players who missed penalties, Beckham sending off in 98, through to Sven and you, it was scapegoating media, very powerful. Like you take the turn up, Graham Taylor, like how many, how many people in their 20s and 30s are going out to buy the paper the next day? Anyway, you know, that power is sort of uh, gone. But it, I think you were one of the last, I would say, to have that vicious tabloid treatment and the media culture then was 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 tough and this and this the um expectations were so high so you were at the uh, right at the cutting edge of that i would have said i don't know what it was like to be in the middle of that storm yeah it, it, it yeah uh, of course there was pressure and, and to deal with the media as part of the job you know but i think you know capello after mm. uh, didn't have success um and and roy you know, with the Iceland result, was also vilified. So I think it carried on. And the difference, the difference is England are winning. They've got a good team, young players coming through, and and they've got the talent and been handled very well in the modern day, in the modern day player, the modern day era, the modern day of social media. Yeah. And everything that is going on with mental health. Um, Gareth is the perfect, perfect person to deal with that. Why? Because many, many of them players, in fact, probably all of them players playing for England, he has known from a very young age because he took the 21s. Mm. And so he has a tremendous connection with them players. He has a story with every one of them players that he's playing. It's why he trusts Sterling. It's why he trusts Mount. You know, and, and that comes from many, many years of developing a relationship. And, you know, other managers wouldn't have that relationship that he has. And he's perfect for that. And his temperament is perfect for that. You know, I, I he was my first signing at Middlesbrough. Mm. 
And I bought him. Why? Because I wanted a leader that epitomised what I wanted on and off the field. And he epitomised that. He was a winner. He did he, he did everything right. He was so professional, first in, last away. But the key thing was he brought people together. There were no clicks. He used to have meals in, on different tables. There were clicks. He would be there in different tables every meal time, making sure that everybody was together. He was the yeah. glue that, that gelled them and brought that club together. And you see that with England. England looked like a club team now. Mm. Not an international team where you know, nowadays Manchester United players came together, Liverpool, Chelsea, there was a lot of rivalry. Doesn't seem that now. No. And I think it's a different era, a different era in the players. They don't feel like that. And I think because of his personality and his, his demeanour, his level, his temperament, they follow him. Mm. they're demonstrating it too yeah sure you see players in tunnels now it's high fives and hugs and it's not as um, vitriolic as it once was you described your era I was just uh, having a quick read you said bit muddled early on which was an interesting comment um, muddled how because you would have had a lot of experience at that stage you'd seen Sven do the job you got off to an okay start initially where did the muddling come in or what did you mean by muddling um just trying to to take the team to maybe a different level and and maybe going too quick and not sticking to what uh, England were good at. So it's a little bit like being pragmatic. And I can understand, you know, Gareth being pragmatic very early on in the tournament to get through the group stage. And he really opened up against Ukraine. Mm. And that was probably the the moment to do that, and um, and possibly I started okay in terms of being pragmatic and what was working before, but but uh, I wanted to try some things, and when they didn't work, then that's when obviously the criticism came, yeah. and you accept that because you have to win with England, and so maybe I I did that in the middle, and then by the time I'd worked that out, we were in trouble in the group. Mm. And it was one game too many with Croatia and, and injuries and uh, things just didn't seem to go our way. Yeah. Like we say about winning tournaments, you have to have a look. And it seemed uh, and that game looked deserted. As well. Yeah, it did a bit. Because 07, there were wins. As you said, looking back, there was a nice run of beating Israel and beating Russia and Estonia and then bad result in Moscow and the pressure is on that night in Croatia and Scott Carson makes a mistake he's not going to make many times in his life and it happens mm. on that night and who knows why it does and Croatia you know little known Croatia in some ways there's a 22 year old kid called Luka Modric who it turns out was a very good player and there's a 19 year old yeah. called Rakitic and all these guys you know yeah. we know how good yeah. that team was um, and then a Wally with a Brawley and all of this stuff um, what's your strongest memory of that night? Um, it, it's strange, isn't it? Because um, the the first half, what a disaster, two 0 down. Yeah, I thought um, I thought it was one of my best half times in my career. Right. In terms of changes and and, and galvanising the team, you Come brought Beckham on, I think, didn't you? Yeah, uh, that's right. Two two. Yeah. And thinking that's job done. And then obviously another yeah, unbelievable strike from 35 yards and bottom corner had opportunities after that. But um, it was um, probably the game epitomised probably my reign with England, like a roller coaster, up and down. A thrill of the ride, as they say. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I came off the rails at the end. Do you drive home that night or back to the hotel, I'm not sure which it was, and think to yourself, I'm done here, I'm toast, that's just over now? Yeah, obviously you do know that because uh, that's the expectation, you have to win. Mm. Um, and so that was no problem. It's a case of uh, recovering from that and and going again. How do you recover from something like that? Um, yeah, good support around you, good family. And, um, you know, I was young at the time, mm. which helped. Mm. Uh, still ambitious, and I think, you know, because of my experiences with with Derby in the beginning, 
uh, with Manchester United, with England, uh, with Middlesbrough, and and then with England, I had something to prove, you know. So I felt I climbed Everest, came down very quickly, mm. and um, dust myself down and wanted to climb Everest again. When you're offered that job, you can't say no to that job. Did anyone in your circle say, mm, "Not so sure, Steve"? Yes, yeah. There's always one who keeps phoning me up and telling me that I shouldn't have done it, but no, I, I'd do it all again. Yeah. There's only a certain amount of times you get offered that job and the opportunity, and 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 yeah, for all for all that, it's given me so many uh, other opportunities around the world. Mm. Not just, you know, I, I could have stayed and played safe at Middlesbrough and, and and carried on in England and played safe, but I didn't. But still, uh, in Europe and, or, and around the world, you know, uh, once you're manager of the, one of the biggest nations in the in the world, then um, you know, it gives you opportunities, opportunities to travel, work work abroad, be abroad. You know, and, and being involved in FIFA, UEFA. So no, I don't. I don't. I don't regret it at no. all, and I'd do no. it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd all do things differently, I suppose. It's not easy, is it? I saw you say uh, a sports psychologist advised you afterwards to take to your cave or your room or wh- wherever you need to go for some kind of reprieve and just to write everything down, get it out of the system. Yeah, that's right, and. Um, Many people talk about keeping a journal every day. You know, I didn't do that, but I made sure that, you know, after that, yeah, I had to sit in a cave. I couldn't go out there. I couldn't leave the house. I couldn't go anywhere. So <laughs> I, was, I was locked in the cave, and not by choice. But um, so it was interesting to reflect. But yeah, yeah, many years ago, and uh, we were trying to move on. So thanks for reminding me. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Really? sorry. Sorry. It's that time in well, England manager. Be, we're trying to be positive about England. I know. And... I know, I know, I know. Sorry, I'm terrible. And that's, well, look, I'm I'm talking about God, the media are terrible and here I am bringing it up again. But I guess, as you said, it's such a high profile job and it's such a, you know, interesting part of your career, I suppose. Uh, it, the Wally with the Brawley thing, sorry to bring that up. That's a particularly kind of stupid and cheap thing. And yet, isn't it terrible how something like that sticks? I presume that's, mentioned to you when you whenever you talk about your England regime, the bloody umbrella, as ridiculous as it is, I guarantee you gets mentioned to you. Yeah, that's right. And it's like, you know, with the uh, with turnip and spending the Swede and and things like that, you know what you're going into. And you know, when when you you know go out of uh don't qualify for a tournament, you gotta take what you get. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's what I've had to do. And uh, yeah, and, and grow a thicker skin, as they say, mm. and carry on with life. Did you feel like you were being ridiculed around that time with you know a headline like that and just the treatment of you trying to yeah. do your best, even if it hasn't gone well? Did it feel like oh, this is you know a bit like the turnip thing? This is a humiliation territory. Did you feel like lines were crossed, or is all fair game? No, that's what you know in the job and. I knew that I'd worked with Sven and oh, how many episodes we'd had with uh, with yeah. Sven over the uh, over the years that uh, I was you know in every press conference with him and so I knew I knew what the job but I took it it's a big gamble big risk uh, but I'd do it again. Mm. It must have made you a better manager, ironically. Um, I think so. I think so. And and all experiences, if you learn, make you make you better. But mm. yeah, I, I I think so. And uh, yeah, so I, I got back on the bike and carried on. And and I, I think I always wanted to stay involved in football and reaching old age. And I'm still involved, so I'm delighted with that. You rebounded brilliantly in Holland. Does the did the phone go cold in England? I, like an England manager, things not going well. You can almost be written off, I would think, in the English game. Is that why you went to Holland? Um, yeah, I couldn't get a job in England. No, you're really? absolutely yeah. right. Uh, mentioned for a job, no, not him. So um, the only thing for me then was to to try and get some reputation back in by going abroad. And um, yeah, Holland was good, uh, a good rebound for me. Mm. 
Roy Hodgson in some ways must be like the inspiration for a lot of managers. Yeah, I think him and 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 Sir Bobby, uh, the late Sir Bobby as well, who um, you know visited many times and you know, had chats with many times. He was the first one. Yeah, go to Holland. He said, go on your own. He said you'll love it. He was obviously there with with PSV and won the league with them. So mm. he told me to go get over there, and uh, it was a uh, wise words and a wise move. Mm. Technical director now with Derby. You must miss the grass, do you? Working with players day to day, do you still have ambitions to get back doing that or are you enjoying the role now? No, I'm, I'm fortunate that, you know, we I asked to come here and, and Wayne Rooney took the took the reins. Um, we we made him manager and um, he's an experience and needs help and needs experience around him. Mm. So I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm, very, I'm, on the, I'm on the field. I've just come off the field, actually. We just started pre-season. Okay. First 11 v 11. And um, yeah, it's great. Sunshine and the players uh, are competing and it's great being back on the grass. I'm in a bit of banter with the players and, and Wayne and passing on a bit of experience and, and hoping that, you know, he can be uh, become as, as good a manager as he was a player. Yeah, well, that'd be some feat. Is, has the game changed much in the last 10, 12, 15 years? Like, are the conversations you might be having tactically with Wayne now different to the ones you were having with Sven? No, the game is simple. We complicate it, coaches complicate it, media complicated. The game is simple. Okay. It's about players. It's about attitude. Uh, it's about being the fittest, about being able to compete technically, tactically. And, um, yeah, they say, I, and I do think, you know, yes, they've introduced different things. Um, Klopp, Guardiola, they've introduced different things, but it was no different than, than in our days. I, you know, when I first started coaching, I used to go watch Glenn Oddle and Ozzy Ardiles. They were doing a 3-5-2 down at Swindon, Ozzy Ardiles four diamond, two up front, different systems. It was fascinating. So the game's not changed. Um, the landscape has in terms of media, players, uh, social media, um, how you handle players. And and now it's a, I think it's a softer skill than a, than a harder skill, if that makes sense. Yes. And um, so you have to adapt. You know, that's what... The gaffer did tremendously for 27 years, even longer because of his time in Aberdeen. Mm. And that's what we all have to do in football. But the game stays the same. You have to defend one box well and in the other, you have to score goals. So how do you see tomorrow's game then? Are you expecting Gareth Seke to remain pragmatic and nothing silly and as has been his want over the last couple of weeks? Or might he pull down the handbrake a touch? I think he, he... he pulled off the handbrake against Ukraine. I think that was everyone was clamouring for for him to open up. Three four three was pragmatic, effective. Got us out the group stage. Got us through Germany. But I think to go on and win a tournament, I think um, the way that he played. Yes, he played four at the back, but Walker was was still tucked in. Shaw was given license to go. The key was Phillips and Rice in mm. front of the back four. Uh, they were key to it, similar to the back three when they were in front. They're the unsung heroes for me. They give protection and make sure that we keep clean sheets and are solid at the back. And because of his 4 2 3 one, he gave us an extra attacker. And we didn't have that. We only had three attackers in each of the four games previous. And with that system formation, it allowed Sancho to come into the team. We had Sterling on one side, Sancho on the other, Mount back in that 10 position causing problems and Kane playing higher and staying in the box. And once you get the ball in the box, as we did, Kane comes alive. And I think you saw that. Uh, we got crosses, we got combinations into the box. Kane's come alive. We scored from two set plays, which we hadn't looked like doing before. So everything came together in that game, total 90 minutes of domination. And the yeah. key was 60 minutes, 4-0 up. Gareth looks around, makes five changes, 
still leaves Grealish and Foden on the bench. I know. And still, the quality that comes on the field, like Henderson, Rashford, is incredible. Yeah. And then you've still got the young talents, conveyor belt of talent like Bellingham coming on, 17 years old. And what a squad that is. It's unbelievable. Mm. And it will only get better. Yeah, it is extraordinary to think that Grealish didn't play at all and that he isn't, he isn't starting a lot of games. Southgate's managed the call for Grealish, which is definitely out there and understandably out there because he's so easy on the eye and such a lovely yeah. player. He's managed to keep all that at bay and whatever way he's handling Grealish as well and Foden, I didn't get the sense there's going to be any sulking going on off the back of the Ukraine game. I don't feel like he would have had to go to Grealish and soften that over. It seems like he's cultivated a nice atmosphere where... Grealish is going to still feel very much involved over the, over the coming days. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, un, unfortunately for Grealish, he's not been involved in the under-21s. Yeah. He's, he's, you know, not really been an international player. And Gareth knows everybody else. Yeah, he's he was with really Grealish. Gre- 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 Grealish was with us. <laughs> I know he was with you and chose right coming over the other side, <laughs> as you say. But... I think he, he, you know, and all managers will do that. Yeah. Turn to the players that you trust. Okay. And Grealish has to build that trust. And he's doing that. That's why he's starting in some games and not in others, because he trusts the likes of Mount, Sterling, Kane. Mm. And Sancho's got to earn that trust. Saka's got to earn that trust. Rashford had it. Now he's got to get that back. And Henderson, you know, you've got Henderson to come back in. The big one was Maguire coming back. So they're huge to the England team. And as long as, I don't want to say pragmatic, but I hope he plays the 4 2 3 1. And it doesn't matter on the personnel because okay. we've got a bench that can change the game. Well, listen, it won't be dull either way. And then maybe a final beyond and the place will go nuts over where you are. I can only imagine the hype, the bandwagon going on over there. Well, if it does, if, if it does, certainly you'll hear it, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. Listen, it's fascinating to get your thoughts on uh, so many different things there. We've taken up more than enough of your time, so we'll let you get back to work at Derby. Enjoy the football over the next couple of nights, Steve. Thanks a million. Pleasure. Cheers, Joe. There you are, Stephen McLaren. Very good with his time. Much appreciated talking to us just before we came on air. And I should let you know, 38 minutes gone. It is nil all between Italy and Spain. Spain have dominated possession. They've owned the game, really. Italy have had one or two moments, but by and large, Spain in control and largely in the Italian half. Donnarumma made one excellent save from Dani Almo, who got the nod to start this evening. As Spain have had a few other half chances. There was one great chance, which Oyatabal failed to control a great through ball from Pedri in the box and it just his touch let him down, ball went behind him but if he had had a, even a half decent touch he would have been in and 8-9 yards out and it would, probably would have been a goal so Spain will be thrilled with this they have been by far the better side 38 minutes on the clock our football coverage on off the ball is with thanks to Paddy Power's Save Our Game donating €10,000 to Irish football for every goal England scored at the Euros after Saturday's win the total has doubled. It's now up to €80,000. All with thanks to Paddy Power for information on responsible gambling. Visit gamblingcare.ie. Back in one sec. Hate missing out? News Talk Extra is news, entertainment and all the latest podcasts. Plus expert tips and competitions straight to your inbox.